everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Commissioner Mary Melina McPhee was elected to the Weston City Council in November 2018. Mary was instrumental in helping the city of Weston adopt the strictest sexual violator code in the state of Florida. Recently, Mary started the first Veterans Association in Weston and is a vice chair of the Broward Coalition of Condominium and Homeowner Associations and a board member of the Weston YMCA Family Center. In August 2021, Mary was appointed to the Broward County Condominium Structural Issues Committee by Broward County Mayor Stephen Geller. And perhaps most impressive for purposes of this podcast, Mary is the longtime president of her own homeowners association, Bermuda Springs in Weston. Mary, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. Well, we are so happy to have you here. First off, I have to say, and if we can't tell, it's going to become apparent throughout this podcast, you are a native New Yorker. (laughs) You moved to Weston in 1991. I, I mean, we've never talked about this, but where in New York are you from? Is that the accent that's making you call that out? (laughs) It is indeed the accent. (laughs) The two thickest accents combined, Brooklyn and Bronx. So I was born in Coney Island. All my family and friends also started school there and then grew up in the Bronx, went back and forth between the two boroughs. So the thickest accent and moved down here almost 30 years ago. So this is as good (laughs) as... This is after 30 years. Wow. So so I do understand you have two daughters and they suffered from some illnesses while attending public schools. Can you tell us how battling for mold remediation in Broward schools was shaped by that personal experience with your family? I've been so blessed. Two great kids. Um, My youngest, 24. My oldest is 34. The youngest is a student at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and she's majoring in logistics and supply chain management. And the oldest is a senior engineer working for Tesla. Two good, strong women I raised, and I'm really proud of them. You know, no matter what they went through growing up and the illnesses, they battled through it, and, you know, they're successful now, and I'm really proud of them. But it was a very difficult time in our family's dynamics. My kids are 10 years apart, so I started off with the oldest sick for quite some time once she started the school system, and then when Brooke came along, ended up sick. By the time the youngest was in first grade, she had pneumonia a couple of times, eye infections, ear infections, molds that had to be removed that were precancerous. Um, the oldest, they diagnosed with something called cyclic vomiting syndrome, which just meant nobody knew why she was as sick as she was and throwing up and had migraines. But yes, once we eventually found out what it was, you know, the transparency took place Parents were informed, teachers were informed, and those teachers and those parents were uh, instrumental in helping make sure that change happened. They snuck pictures out. They got samples out of the schools. They were tested in spite of what school systems wanted to happen. And lots of remediation took place. Was it a a process of elimination in terms of determining how your children were exposed to the mold? How did, what was the process of elimination to determine that it was mold in the schools? Very good question. Continuously in and out of doctor's offices and nobody could figure out what it was until a science teacher came to me while my daughter was in portables in sixth grade and explained some of what was taking place with teachers and other students. And he wanted to be kept confidential on everything that he was stating to me. As a native New Yorker, hearing something about mold, the only thing I could think about was mold in your showers. You know, I had no idea mold could make you that sick. And once I started doing the research, it was frightening. And I brought that to the doctors. She went to specialists and every single doctor she went to agreed that these types of molds that we found in the school would create these illnesses in the teachers and the children. There was such an abundance on the walls, the ceilings, there were placards on walls that were put up just to hide the mold that was dripping down behind the um, placards. There were holes in portables that you can literally see down to the 
ground underneath because the wood was actually eaten away. I remember the reporting when the, the pods started because my kids were little at that time too, and the pods were being built. And, you know, again, with our climate here in Florida, so hot, so humid, so rainy, have the construction methods changed over the years as a result of this coming to light that mold can be endemic and these and it can seriously harm the students and the teachers? You know, at the time, what we fought for and what we were able to get was remediation in all of these six schools and indoor air quality issues taken care of. And yes, they implemented something called tools for schools. They put in new protocols. They created more transparency so that the parents would know what was taking place with the facilities and maintenance. And yes, they amped up their game as far as maintenance. I do understand that now after 20 years, there are issues again, but at least the transparency and record keeping is now there and in place when parents want it. Well, the reason I was interested in your your personal fight and your professional fight regarding mold remediation is because, you know, the, this podcast, Take It to the Board, focuses on life and community associations. You know, it's it's really a question when you've got a multifamily building, it's it's a question of when, not if you're going to get leaks. You, you are, you're, you know, over the years either through the roof or the windows or the building envelope, uh, even from uh, appliances that are failing, we're always going to have leaks. So the issue of mold always comes up in our multifamily buildings. But in terms of knowing what you know about mold, has this been helpful to deal with multifamily buildings who have mold issues? Absolutely, because it's taken seriously now. I think before this, when I heard the word mold, it Probably like the average person, you don't think much of it other than something in your bathroom in a tile. You just don't realize the significance to your health and your family's health. But in our industry, we refer a lot to sealing the envelope and trying to keep water intrusion out. So you're making sure you don't have leaks in the roof and your windows, your front doors, and it all goes back to the same basis, uh, basics, which is maintenance of the property. When you're following a basic and thorough uh, maintenance protocol that you have in place year after year, you're able to spot these items and you're able to stay on top of them and probably stop them before they got worse. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important, particularly when it comes to mold, that this is really a collaboration between the board, the manager, and the residents. Because I have had some communities, Mary, where there have been tenants in place where there was a leak in the unit for m- many months and nothing was ever reported. So you really do. In a lot of my communities, I create a water leak policy where it clearly outlines, you know, if you have a leak, please report it as soon as possible. And then, of course, once it's reported, it's 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 important that the board and or manager follow up, try to determine the source of that leak, and then quickly hop on it. So there is no proliferation of mold. Uh, You remediate inside the unit, you make sure that mold's not spreading to other units or the common areas. I agree 100% regarding maintenance. I do think it's a collaboration though, because sometimes people are living with leaks in their units and they're not telling anybody. Huge problem. Huge problem to the association industry, huge problem to the insurance industry, also to the health insurance industry. When you have people going back and forth to doctors and they have no idea why they are sick. You played a key role in the Broward Coalition, an organization that's more than 40 years old and represents approximately 400 shared ownership communities throughout South Florida. So what's been your role with this group? Oh my gosh, it's a passion. I love the Broward Coalition. I started with the Broward Coalition, I want to say about 20 years ago, and started off as a member, attended their monthly meetings, and realized there was a big space to fill as far as bringing in education for the associations. So at that time, I was able to pull together the first uh, seminar where we brought in experts on different topics. And we haven't stopped since. We grew our membership. We've had some great leadership and also some great members. We know that you've been instrumental in making sure that our organization got the word out as far as education as well. We've had Charlotte Greenberg, Patty Lynn, Toby Foyer, Louis Alicia. All of these individuals have played key roles in making the Broward Coalition what it is today, which is it's fantastic. 
So education is key, you, you know, and I, I've been fortunate to be uh, invited to your, your meetings as speakers. And let's be honest, you feed people too. Are you still feeding people while you're educating them? <laughs> we do, except we've taken a hiatus like most organizations because of COVID. But yes, we get, we serve lunch and it's a great way to sit back, relax, have your lunch and learn at the same time. Listen, that shared wisdom amongst the people sitting in the audience where they turn to somebody and they say, you know, hey, we use this contract or we're, we're dealing with this issue right now. We find that with the classes we teach here at Becker too, that while we're educating them, they're also educating us on some of the novel ideas and issues and problems that arise. And they're educating each other as they're sharing, you know, yeah, sometimes battle, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they're war stories and other times suggestions, best tips, best practices in the industry. Truly, you don't know what you don't know until it's brought to light. And then it's one of those light bulb moments. So does the coalition get involved in shaping community association legislation in Florida? Absolutely. Do we set out continuously to do it? No, but we have had everyone from our congresswoman, state representatives, senators, county commissioners, city commissioners attend our meetings. And I'm grateful and happy to say that they've heard our membership. And what better way to get the word out than to have a large group of seniors write handwritten letters <laughs> expressing their thoughts and concerns or happiness on certain issues. It's a, it's a great venue for expressing one's thoughts on legislation. So once upon a time, I think it was back in 2005, 2006, we flew a group of those same senior community leaders up to Tallahassee. We chartered a plane it was a challenge. It was an experience walking the halls and making those appointments. Well, talked about till today. I agree. <laughs> that flight up. That's right. I remember. Um, but how willing have how willing have Florida legislators been to sit down with you and your group and talk about these issues? Because a lot of times, listen, we have a part time legislature in Florida, as you well know, sixty day session. They're they're just besieged with requests. Uh, they're certainly not subject matter experts in all of the bills. Even the ones they sponsor, sometimes they're not subject matter experts. They've got six bill slots each. They're time strapped for sure. And they're very reliant on the input they get. I've always been concerned because sometimes you've got legislators who are really only hearing one side of a story when it comes to proposed legislation. And this could be on either side of the aisle. OK, it could be owners who are saying boards have too much power and, you know, we need to rein them in. Or you could have boards saying, we are being harassed by some owners. We need more tools. Do you think the legislators have been willing to sit with your group and kind of have an open mind about how to craft solutions legislatively for a state as big as Florida? That is an incredibly important question. Yes, I think that the legislators that have Broward County as their district listen and hear what we have to say. But in this huge state, some place like Nassau County that has 73,000 people, and then you have Broward County, totally uh, probably six, seven hours south from it, that has 2 million people. What one legislator is pushing up there that's going to affect the entire state and what one legislator down here is pushing that's going to affect the entire state may not be a one size fit all. As we both know, we've seen legislation come across and we're like, holy moly, that is actually counterproductive to us down here. Every area is fighting for what they need and speaking out on what they need. I'm more hopeful that they will take the bigger picture into consideration. Well, we have 60,000 associations here, right? And they're all di they're all different depending on their demographics. Our, our housing for older persons communities have special needs. Our coastal communities have special needs. Our homeowners associations have different needs than our cooperatives and our condominium associations. Size does matter in terms of the smaller associations have a harder time getting people to serve on the board as opposed to our very large associations. To your point, Mary, the one size fits all legislative approach, it really is problematic in a state like ours with as many shared ownership communities as we have. What would be your recommendation in terms of getting people 
to give a balanced picture. Because look, there are problems in associations. We know that. There are problems with sometimes boards who aren't doing the right thing. They're not listening. Everything's way too informal. We've got some other great boards that are what I consider to be highly functioning communities. And then sometimes we've got residents in some communities that are actually making it much harder for the community to function well, because they are either harassing or engaging on a daily basis with the manager or the board in a negative manner. What is your recommendation as to how our legislators can get a more complete picture of what the community association lifestyle really means? Honestly, it goes right back to something so basic, communication. They really need to reach out to organizations that have their the pulse of what's happening in all different areas of the state, not just their area. They might be helping, they believe, their area, but they're hurting the rest of the state. Counterproductive, obviously. Communication is huge. Legislator to legislator, and then also reach out to these groups that are making themselves accessible to help legislators better understand different issues. We want to answer questions on how things are, and we, and we want to make sure that our property values are protected and the way we live is protected. So reach out. I think it's a great recommendation. And by the way, it's not too late. Listen, the summer is the best time to meet with your legislators when they're back in their district offices. Committee weeks start in the early fall and then, you know, you're off to the races. It's very hard to get in touch with your legislators once they head to Tallahassee. I mentioned at the at the outset, Mary, that you're actually serving on the board of directors of your own homeowners association in Weston, Bermuda Springs. How long have you been on the board? Oh my gosh, I've been on that board I want to say for about 15 years. God bless you. I was on my board for two years, okay, at my homeowners association. My husband, Michael, who's also an attorney, he had been on the board for like six years before they called it, the, they jokingly called it the burger seat because they always wanted an, an attorney in one of the seats. I did it for two years. It was enough considering my day job, but I found it to be an eye-opening experience, both in terms of sitting at that table in the meeting in a board meeting, looking out at your neighbors, trying to explain why you're doing the things you're doing, perhaps why you need to levy that special assessment. But I also found it eye-opening dealing with my fellow board members where we could both be looking at a section of the documents and there are different, vastly different interpretations of what those documents mean. Tell us a little bit about your experience being on the board. That's such an interesting comment because I find it from the association side, you can reach out to several different attorneys and get different answers to the same question and the same statutes. So that brings me back to wondering how clear is this legislation being created and written? And why is it always written so that we can't easily understand it? <laughs> there are some who would say that attorneys write it, so you have to call the attorney for the interpretation. But I agree with you. That has been a huge hot button topic for me is what we call legalese. Our statutes, as you know, are very bloated when it comes to our shared ownership statutes. 718, 719, 720. 718, the Condominium Act, it's over 140 pages. I, I think it's Montana or one of the states out west. I think they have a two-page statute for oh the shared God. ownership, for their shared ownership statute. That's a little sparse. Ours is a little, as I said, a little bloated. But you're right. It becomes hard for people to interpret, even we're talking about the statute, but even their governing documents where attorneys continue to insert legalese into their amendments when these documents are amended. I had a contest one time with some of my associates. Um, one of the associates had written a 160 word sentence. And at oh, that time, I had a 160 word sentence and I had uh, Panther tickets with a parking pass. And I said, whoever can take this sentence and whittle it down to the fewest words with the same meaning gets these tickets. And the winning, the winning sentence was, I, I think, 11 words. I can write a 160 word uh, sentence. <laughs> well, you, you know that old you know that old saying, that old joke. I, I would have written a shorter letter if I had more time. So how many how many homes are in your community, Mary? We have 206 homes. And and how many board members? We have five. Five and you have professional management. 
Professional management, yes. Do you feel like, though, that it's it's become a significant job serving on this board, overseeing a community with 206 homes, even with professional management in place? It depends on what's happening. The pandemic created something, I mean, that none of us have ever had to deal with. And that became almost full time, depending on what's going on, depending on the projects that you take on. So depending on what's taking place is whether or not it becomes time consuming. Right? Like yours, I'm in a, in a West, I'm in a Western Broward um, homeowners association. We had three big things. Are you ready for these? Yes. One mailboxes. <laughs> There you go. Okay. The board, we wanted uniform mailboxes. My neighbor, who I loved, elderly woman, she refused. She just kept, she just kept fixing her wooden mailbox forever until it literally just fell apart one day. The other big thing were trees in our neighborhood. We ha- we are in, we are a neighborhood with a beautiful live oak canopy. But I remember, and this is actually going back to the day when I was at the board, we had one board member, he wanted to just put a big live oak in everybody's front yard in, you know, because the association had a maintenance, a landscape easement, and it didn't go with everybody's decor. And the third one was speed bumps. We've dealt with each one of those issues. And then some of the other big topics are on street parking. You know, there's just all sorts of issues depending on the time of year and what's taking place. I mean, literally down to pressure washing sidewalks or roof color, whoever's feeling very passionate about a specific topic is how large that topic grows. So yeah. some board members, it's uncomfortable for them to be unpopular, to make an unpopular decision, whether it's we need to pass the special assessment because we need to pave the roads or you know to make a decision about going after someone in, who's been delinquent in terms of the assessments. You've served on the board for 15 years. Have you had to make some unpopular decisions? Absolutely, because you can never uh, please everyone. You have 206 homes. You know there will always be a chunk that are happy for it, a chunk that's not happy for it, happy about it. And that's probably one of the most frustrating situations I find for myself is wishing I could make everybody happy, but knowing that it's impossible and that I need to just do what's right by my governing documents and ultimately what's right by the association property values. I think that statement that you can't make everybody happy was never more true during the pandemic. So for all the people who were saying, we want the pool open, we want the clubhouse open, we don't want any COVID safety protocols. We had other people in the same community that were saying, you're not doing enough. We, we don't want outside guests coming in right now. We don't want large construction projects going on right now when we are in the midst of a pandemic. You're right. You've got people have to understand that in the community, as many people are pushing in one way, you've got people pulling in the other. Absolutely. Every single community. I, I heard from community after community, resident after resident, same thing. One would be on one side of it. Another person would be completely on the opposite side of it. So as if you didn't have enough going on in your life, Mary, (laughs) you decided to run for and win seat four on the Weston City Commission. What made you want to serve on the Weston City Commission? I find out about something that doesn't seem either fair or okay for a certain population of people, and it drives me. So in the city of Weston, Back in the day when I moved here, I found out that there weren't police or nurses in school. And coming from New York, that was horrifying. I mean, there were no resource officers in the school in Weston? So this is about 30 years ago when I first moved here. Every school. So you had mommies volunteering as nurses and there were no police. And so at that time, I went to the school system and they told me, well, here in Florida, we don't do that. So <laughs> years <laughs> passed. We finally formed a government in the city of Weston. I went to my city government and asked, and maybe that was about 20 years ago, hey, we need police officers and nurses in school. And at that time, I was told, sorry, not our ability to change or get involved. And that's something for the school board. And then, unfortunately, we had the February 14th, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, horrible killing of 17 human beings. And at that time, I went back before the city commission. This is right before I was elected and stood there and said, let's do what we need to. 
Let's pay for it. City government needs to pay for it. If the school system is still refusing to, let's protect our children. Luckily, the city commission at that time passed that. And to this day, we're still paying for it. And I think most most cities are paying for their resource officers. And no, not every school has a nurse yet. And you would think these would be the most fundamental things in the school in the schools in Broward County. And no, we don't have it. That must be very gratifying, though, to see you had a vision, you went after it, and it became a reality. I'm guessing you got a lot of feedback from grateful parents. No, it broke my heart. It was something that seemed like common sense, but then 17 people died to make something change. And why do we wait to that point when we see things that are wrong? Just like the sexual violators code in the city of Weston and other cities at this point, I challenge them, meet the code that the city of Weston has, make it stricter, make it more transparent, make sure that our children and our most vulnerable are as as protected as humanly possible. Let's do it. Let's get together and do it. I love that energy. Weston has been an example, a shining example to a lot of other cities when it comes to community association issues. I think this is probably because it's a city almost entirely comprised of residential private communities. I mean, you drive through it, it's one one mandatory association after another. But I'm I'm thinking of one specific example, Mary, uh, because I live in Plantation, When it came to removing hurricane debris, so over the years, you know, FEMA reimburses for removing hurricane debris, but they've taken, FEMA's taken the position that if you live in a guard-gated community, they're not going to reimburse for removal of that debris. So people living in those communities almost get taxed twice. They pay their association and they pay their taxes. And guess what? They're not getting the debris removal. But I remember a couple of years back that Weston was the city that said, we don't care if we're not going to get reimbursed from FEMA. We are removing everybody's debris post-hurricane, whether you live inside a community association surrounded by a guard gate and a wall or not. They did that in one situation. Actually, I've been fighting for them to do that in every situation. I've seen other cities take the lead in doing that because of exactly what you said. Those that live inside gated communities are paying two taxes. They pay internally to make sure that their roads are kept clean and safe and debris is removed. And then they're paying it to the government. It's really unfair when it's needed. But I would like to see my city do more of that and be proactive and set something in place. To date, I have brought it up quite a few times. I've spoken to my congresswoman at nauseum about it. So let's see what happens eventually. All right. I'll check back in with you on that. We've got a few more months left in hurricane season here. Mary, recently I represented a group of Weston owners in a homeowners association, which was still under developer control. They had security concerns about their community. And I picked up the phone, I called you, and I was really impressed with how quickly you leapt into action. I mean, you were out there the next day, you were meeting with them. How often are you contacted by Weston residents who need help in their communities? And what's the extent of what you can do to help them? You know, that's a good question because most people would be surprised that it is every single day. Every single day I'm contacted in one way or another regarding uh, something to do, obviously, with somebody living in, in Weston. And it all depends on what the issue is. I have access to city managers, city officials, county officials, state representatives, senators. And of course, I have people in all different types of expertise like yourself in association law. I can turn around and ask questions or guide somebody to get information in those directions What is the saying? You don't have to be an expert in everything. You just need to know an expert in everything. (laughs) I got that down. In this situation, it was a really good practical example of how reaching out to your local representative can help get things done. In this case, it was a security concern. Just quickly tell me, you walked through and you, you managed to address those security concerns. Because I understand associations, which was an important aspect of it, I was able to call in the right people to take a look at things and and literally turn the residents back towards either legal, uh, law enforcement, security, the developer. You know, it does go back to me having a background in associations, but I care. So it's important. It's my job. 
you you definitely care because you were out there. I think the local sheriff came out. They identified some areas that could be tightened up in terms of lighting and landscaping, even uh, filling in some gaps where there were security issues. So again, thank you for that. You've been appointed to the Broward County Condominium Structural Issues Committee by Broward County Mayor Stephen Geller. So the goal of this committee is to review the county's current rules and regulations regarding high-rise condominiums and to determine which governmental bodies have jurisdiction over condominium safety and receive public input. What do you expect from your role on this committee? And how many committee members are there? I believe we have 15 members. So we're representing the Board of Appeals. We represent the association industry as association attorneys. You have board members, you have uh, city commissioners, uh, state representatives, senators on the board, and of course, our county mayor, Mayor Steve Geller. And Do you have engineers on the committee, though? Because I imagine part of your work is trying to determine where the respective obligations and responsibilities lay when it comes to protecting the structural safety of, of multifamily buildings. Again, I, I would assume you, you're going to have some engineering input on that because as lay people, we can't really determine that. Absolutely. Not only did we bring engineers before us to explain their thoughts on things and, and factual information to us, we also have engineers sitting on the board via their background, whether it's the Board of Appeals gentlemen or one of the uh, city commissioners that has an engineering background. We've brought engineers before us to ask questions and enlighten us. You know, it's like any other industry. There's a wide range of skill sets and abilities in the engineering industry. Same thing with legal, same thing with accounting. One of the things I'd like to see happen, Mary, is when volunteer boards and their managers are looking to hire an engineer, where do they go? Where do I mean, I've had a client recently that that, that produced a report and it was from a home inspection company. Oh, Not an engineer. This company built themselves as being specialists in terms of coming up with reserve amounts for a roof. But again, it was really a home inspection company. Isn't it possible for the counties or cities to do some sort of vetting when it comes to making it easier for volunteer boards to figure out who are the best engineers to hire? It's a good question. You know, I guess it's just like any other vendor. These board members have to do their homework, and so do managers. One of the suggestions that the committee is giving is more education for association managers. Several years ago, it went from 20 hours down to 15 hours. I don't know why our legislation thought that it would be a good idea to remove the amount of hours of education when it was so few already. But our committee has made a suggestion to add three additional hours, one in building maintenance, one specific to reserves, and one specific to the building inspection, uh, safety inspection. So to at least get a basis and a better understanding on those topics that can help better guide board members, as we both know, are volunteers and maybe not experts in any of those fields. It would be helpful if there was, you know, some some resources they could go to where an engineer has to qualify to meet a minimum standard to be on this list. And it would be easier for board members to go and look at that list and see if the engineer they're considering hiring has, has basically met that baseline in terms of competency. So but something, as something we both to know, does it make sense? Doesn't mean that it always happens. So. Uh, well, you're so, you know, you mentioned increasing uh, education for managers, which I think is excellent, increasing education requirements for volunteer board members. But the last couple of years in Florida, and I think this started with Governor Rick Scott, there's been a push to deregulate the management industry in Florida there are not really high barriers to entry for managers in Florida. I think it's 19 hours and you take a test. I am not in favor of deregulating the management industry in Florida. I know in other states, there is no licensing requirement for managers. I think that's a mistake. What do you think? Every state should have requirements for management. And I just have no idea why in the state of Florida, they would deregulate it or take away hours or make it watered down in any way. It should be so much more difficult and it should be so much more in-depth 
into the financial aspect, the safety aspect, the facilities aspect of it. There's so much to it, literally down to the mediation side of board members and the interaction with residents. There's so much to this. So we've talked a lot about education today, Mary. And like me, I know you have an affinity for taking classes. What, what are your favorite classes to attend? Between my mediation certification and the LCAM license, I'm continuously taking classes for the last 25 years. I'm in classes. Every <laughs> Probably the, my favorite is anything to do with mediation, anything to do with law, anything to do with human resources. I find that I'm much more engaged so I'm able to focus better in those classes. <laughs> well, that's good to know. I, I've been doing that. I like the master class series. I, I started during the pandemic. It was just a way to stress out. I think I've done cooking and architecture. They don't have any, they don't have a legal class on master class. Maybe something to, something to look into. So, so last question, you've earned a first black belt in karate. Please tell me <laughs> you haven't had to use that at any of your board meetings or commission meetings. I am happy to say I have not had to use those skills in any meeting whatsoever. I have a feeling, though, that that you're gonna we're gonna continue to hear about you in politics. Uh, I think you should run for the Florida Senate. I or the House, that, and I hope if I do do something like that, I have you as a strong resource to turn to because you've been fantastic in our field. Thank you. That is my pleasure, and you certainly can count on my support. Thanks Thank again. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Leave a review so more people can take it to the board and visit takeittotheboard.com for more information.